carbon offsetting, an environmental savior or a greenwashed illusion. And if you're like me, and you probably are since you're watching this video, you're worried about climate change. And you've probably heard that carbon offsetting is this critical tool to stem the catastrophic trajectory that we're on. But today we're going to peel back the layers to see if it's truly the solution that we need or if it's just a greenwash band-aid over a gaping wound. Companies all over the world are jumping on the carbon offset bandwagon, from airline to tech giants, they're all pledging to go carbon neutral. But what does that really mean? Is it a genuine step towards sustainability or just a way to ease our eco guilt and excuse an overarching business as usual attitude while we carry on with our usual consumption patterns? Hey everybody, I'm Amber from Sustainable Jungle, where we share sustainability tips, tricks, hacks, stories, products, and brands to better our planet. And one of the most common and shared ways that many of these brands claim to be bettering our planet is through carbon offsetting. Now, you've no doubt heard the term by now. It's a concept that's gained a lot of traction in recent years, but is it really as effective as we've been sold? Today, I'm gonna dive into the data, examining the effectiveness of these offsets and revealing some pretty uncomfortable truths. But first, let's take a second to understand what carbon offsetting is. Essentially, it's the process of compensating for carbon dioxide emissions by funding projects that reduce or remove an equivalent amount of CO2 from the atmosphere. While the specifics of how these offsets are bought and traded like stocks gets a little bit convoluted for those like myself who are not particularly financially minded, the core concept is pretty simple. Doing something positive for the environment to counteract the ways that you've negatively impacted it. Now, carbon offset projects range from reforestation and renewable agriculture to renewable energy initiatives, industrial gas capture, and energy efficiency initiatives. Sounds good, right? Absolutely. As good as companies and marketing purports it to be? Well, that's where offsetting gets a little bit off-putting. So to better frame how this supposed solution stacks up against the climate crisis, we should get a look at the problem in the first place. According to the International Energy Agency, global CO2 emissions reached 37.55 billion tons in 2023, rising about half a billion tons every year, not including 2020, where we obviously saw a dip, though at still 35 billion tons, maybe not as big of a dip as we would have expected considering the lack of travel and in-office work. Kind of makes you wonder. Now, at the same time, the global carbon credit market is growing, though far more exponentially. In 2021, almost 500 million voluntary carbon credits, which is where companies can buy offsets to claim carbon neutrality, were traded at an average of four US dollars per ton. Now that was already a 60% increase from 2020. And then in 2022, the market nearly doubled in value with each ton averaging $7.37 and the market total reaching a value of $2 billion. So essentially since 2020, carbon credits have quadrupled. On the surface, that sounds great. But if you think about it, with such rapid growth, shouldn't we expect to see some sort of impact on the growing rate of emissions? So what are all these offsets the companies are buying to reach carbon neutrality actually doing? Would it be way worse were they not? Or would the difference be negligible? Short of the ability to time travel into a parallel universe in which we're not spending so much money and focus on offsetting efforts, we can't speak for sure on the efficacy of carbon credits, but we can say with some degree of certainty that they're not working as advertised and expected. In fact, a study published by the University of Cambridge concluded that only 12% of the total volume of existing credits constitute real emissions reductions, with 0% for renewable energy, 0.4% for cook stoves, 25% for reforestation, and 27.5% for chemical processes. In other words, a whopping 88% of carbon credits purchased in those sectors did seemingly nothing to reduce overall climate change driving emissions. So why is this so? Well, there's a few reasons, the first of which being lack of additionality. Now, additionality refers to whether the proposed project is distinct from its baseline scenario. In other words, would that decrease of emissions have been possible or happened anyway without the purchase of those carbon credits? Verified carbon projects are all said to pass an additionality test before the project can even begin and gain funding. But despite that, one EU study found that up to 85% of offset projects under the clean development mechanism failed to deliver a additional emissions reductions. This leads us to our second issue, verification problems. So ensuring that offsets are real and verifiable is challenging and demonstrated by that last stat, we can see that even verified projects might not be having the effect they're supposed to. In some cases, companies have been found to overstate the impact of their offset projects. There is no regulation about offsets in particular that measures their quality, whether or not they're permanent, 
um, whether or not they really are providing the emission reductions that they're often um, told. The Guardian reported that more than 90% of rainforest offset credits by Vera, the world's leading carbon standard for the voluntary markets, by the way, could be phantom credits and not represent real emissions reductions. The study looked at 29 different Vera approved projects and found that only eight of them showed evidence of meaningful deforestation reductions. How is that even possible? Well, the study looked into that too, and they found that Vera inflated and exaggerated their baseline forest loss numbers by about 400%. So obviously their efforts appeared to be a lot more meaningful than they actually were. The next major problem is permanence. Forestry projects are a really popular form of offsetting initiatives, and you've no doubt seen your favorite brands crying, we plant one tree for every item purchased, which is like an extra little treat for ourselves every time we buy something we don't need. But for some perspective, to capture one ton of carbon dioxide, you would have to grow approximately 50 trees for one whole year. And here's the thing. Trees can be cut down, they can be burned, they can be destroyed, releasing carbon right back into the atmosphere, by the way, when that happens. For example, wildfires in California in 2020 wiped out millions of dollars worth of carbon offsets. So consider Volkswagen, who invested really heavily in forest projects to offset emissions in 2020. And yes, the trees were planted, though it was later claimed that these newly reforested areas were promptly deforested again. So what was the point? The fourth major issue that carbon offsets have to contend with is leakage. Now, leakage is the phenomenon through which efforts to reduce emissions in one place simply shift those emissions to another location or sector where they remain uncontrolled or unaccounted for. Now, renewable energy is one example. Now, we absolutely love the idea of renewable energy, and we do believe that we have to come up with clean energy solutions to sever our ties with fossil fuel. But the problem is that many of our current renewable solutions have a major impact of their own. Sure, those carbon credits are increasing solar infrastructure, but is the energy saved through through that enough to also offset the impact of mining those materials, such as quartz, aluminum, copper, and silver, not to mention the lithium and cobalt needed to run the batteries they're often paired with. For this reason, some experts suggest that the solution has to rely with nature-based interventions like renewable agriculture. Problem number five is trading. So it's really important to keep in mind that the carbon credit market is essentially a money market. They're bought and traded just like stocks, and here is where we need to talk about the two different sectors of the carbon market voluntary and compliance. So the biggest difference between the two, as the name suggests, is that voluntary credits aren't required. They're something that companies can opt to do of their own volition to reduce their impact, or to appeal to a growing niche of sustainable shoppers who know that they care about the appearance of having done so. But that's a whole other issue. Perhaps a reforestation project reforests 247 acres of deforested land and converts 40,000 tons of carbon dioxide into saved carbon emissions. A company can basically then say, our emissions totaled 20,000 tons, so we'll buy half of that project's impact. Now, the compliance market, on the other hand, is regulated and enforced by national, regional, and international carbon reduction regimes that limit the amount of GHGs that a country or industry can emit. And while, yes, we absolutely need more legislation and regulation of carbon emissions at a policy level, but the current big issue with this market is that countries who surpass their emission reduction targets can then sell those surplus credits to those who have fallen short as a way of offsetting their emissions. So. That's basically like you using a reusable water bottle all year and saying, well, I saved this many plastic bottles compared to how many I would have used, so that gives my friend here the permission to use them in my stead. For a price, of course. The point being that a company or a country can just basically buy their way to carbon neutrality without having to do a thing, sustainability speaking. Pretty backwards logic, right? Now, if the goal of the compliance carbon market was to actually encourage and require countries to reduce emissions, this loophole simply wouldn't exist. Now, above all, many feel that offsets give companies and individuals alike a license to pollute, allowing them to continue harmful practices under the guise of being carbon neutral. And it's greenwashing, plain and simple. And this moral hazard greatly impedes progress on the whole. So even if there are brands out there that are really trying to make a difference, if there's an equal number or even a far fewer amount of far bigger brands out there that are only using offsets as an excuse to behave irresponsibly by mass manufacturing goods, not switching to more sustainable material alternatives, and generally just feeding into the make, take, waste cycle of consumption that's gotten us into this mess that we're in, it's going to negate any potential for good. So if carbon offsetting is not the silver bullet solution, what is? We clearly can't just stand by and do nothing. So what's the answer? Well, a lot of things actually. Things like carbon capture and storage and regenerative agriculture are two really promising avenues, but they're ones that are really only just starting to gain traction. 
Unfortunately, many of those require a lot more effort and aren't necessarily accessible changes to the individual consumer. So what we can do, however, is use our vote to ensure these policy changes happen at the legislative level and support brands and companies that are choosing these methods. First and foremost, and this is something that we've said on SJ for years, companies should be focusing on reducing their own emissions directly through energy efficiency, renewable energy adoption, and sustainable practices, not just offsetting them. And sure, absolutely no one can erase their carbon footprint entirely. Even if you lived completely off-grid in a sustainable homestead, you would still have some sort of impact. Offsetting is perfect for those remaining emissions that we can't otherwise outright eliminate. In other words, much like recycling in the five R's of zero waste, offsetting should be a last resort and not a first go-to. So, is carbon offsetting more of a problem than a solution? Well, it has its place. It's clearly not the silver bullet we'd hoped it would be, but it does have its place. But still, we need to prioritize direct emissions reductions first and systemic changes to truly combat climate change. But now I would love to hear from you. What do you think about carbon offsetting? Have you ever purchased them? What's your attitude? What's your philosophy if you do? Does it impact your opinion of a brand when you see that they do? Are you more likely to shop from carbon neutral companies or do you look beyond that? Please let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more insights on environmental issues. Once again, this is Amber from Sustainable Jungle and thank you for watching.